I, I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to thank I was and the organization, the list and both in action for all of their hard work and for everything they're doing. As I sat back there, I went kind of a little bit through memory lane. When I was a child, we were among the first residents of the Amazon Apache Coast. And my mom would always talk about the work and the effort it took Father Frank Casey, along with the help of Governor Roosevelt, to get those built. So we lived on Amazon Apache on Roleta, as I was growing up. And I actually started school at Crockett elementary. So hearing all of you talk about all of the work that you're doing in my old, old neighborhood really makes me feel very special, but especially so because of the work you're doing that's going to impact all those children that live in those neighborhoods. So please, thank you all so much, and especially you for kind of organizing all of this. Community Networks is an effort that AARP has been involved with since 2012. In April of 2012, we launched the AARP H Friendly Community Network, serving as the U.S. affiliate for the World Health Organization. Here in San Antonio on June 19th of this year, Mayor Castro signed the agreement with the leadership of the national AARP that San Antonio would become an age-friendly community. An age-friendly city is an inclusive and accessible urban environment that promotes active aging, and I want to add healthy active aging to that. I interject healthy because I think that is equally as important. The age, ARP network of age-friendly communities helps participating U.S. communities become a great place for all ages by adopting such features as safe, workable streets, sidewalks, and better housing and transportation options. AARP has policies that help us to promote these efforts and include improving health, engaging residents, creating a sense of space, fostering home and community-based service delivery, and achieving other goals. We are in a time, and I don't need to tell you all this because obviously you know the problem. We're entering a time of profound and permanent change to the demographic composition of America. We are getting older, and the young are not producing as an old enough. I mean, I come from a family of eight. My daughter has two kids. My son has one kid. What does that say? You know, about the aging years. Every day, 10,000 baby boomers reach the age of 65, and by 2030, America will have twice as many people over the age of 65. And that is going to impact your work and the work that ARP is doing. One in three Americans is now age 50 or older, and by 2030, one in five will be 65 plus. Is our community ready? What do you think? Is San Antonio age friendly? At this time, one third of the people of San Antonio residents are 50 plus. AARP at this time has over 130,000 members who are over the age of, uh, I think it's 100. One of our one of our more active volunteers is Mr. Frank Cor Corbus, who just got the Volunteer of the Year Award, and he is, I believe, 98, and he lives in Dallas. And he is one of our active volunteers. 
One third of the citizens decided to feel like we said our age 50 plus. And what do you think? Is San Antonio age friendly right now? I think we have a long, long way to go. Survey after survey tells us that us older folks want to stay at home. 86% of adults 45 plus agree strongly, strongly with the statement, what I'd really like to do is stay in my current residence for as long as possible. For some of us, it's a little bit easy. For some of us, it's not so easy. My husband and I have lived in our home for 40 years. When we bought the home, that house is not wheelchair accessible. The doors are not wide enough. So that's not really a livable house for us to stay in as long as we want, as long as we're able. One of the things that we've done, and I'm just going to give you this as an aside, is more recently we had the bathroom modified. We had the old door taken out, and we had a larger door pulled in that opened out rather than in. We had a shower put in and to walk in with a seat in the shower. That's so that if, God forbid, one of us winds up in a wheelchair, we can still stay home because we now have made the bathroom wheelchair accessible. We've also done that with the front of our house. We can do that. A lot of people cannot. But there are ways. I know that, for instance, ACON has funds they do help put in wraps for folks in their homes when they need them. And there are other uh, groups in the city that do that. Who have funds, Matt? Yes. Matt, who has the funds? ACOC, the Elementary Account of Governments, yes. They get so many dollars every year, and they sometimes run out, but it doesn't hurt to call. The thing is there, how I many of the seniors know about that? It should be out there in the community. It's not, I'm just trying to, it's not out there completely. Okay. So we don't know where to go to unless you have SSI and that will help you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I'm here then because I gave you some new information and afterwards I can talk to you about that. Okay? Okay. Like I said, most homes are not designed to adapt. Survey of, okay. I'm sorry, but I'm not okay. I'm sorry about that. Homes have been traditionally designed and built for the 35 year old. And especially if your home is kind of like mine, over 30 years ago. <coughs> okay, survey again after survey reports that today's over adults want to stay in their community. Transportation then might become an issue. Adults 45 plus agree or strongly agree with the statement, what I'd really like to do is stay in my current community as long as possible. For the last 50 years, our communities have developed around motor vehicles as a principal form of transportation. How many of you are still driving? That is great. I had to stop driving two years ago. My husband is now my uh, volunteer chauffeur assistant for ARP. He has to drive me everywhere we go. My eyes do not permit me to, although my ophthalmologist says that I could drive, I don't want to risk anybody's life. So I refuse to drive. I still have my driver's license and I use it for ID, but I will not get in the car and drive. I'm not safe. So, I'll tell you that up front. I have no problem. I have no problem telling you that, but I know I've seen some folks going down the road that have trouble. Did you pull this one here? Watch. But our communities, let's face it, we're not built for to be friendly. It would be nice if the communities were built where we could walk everywhere we needed to go and the grocery store was nearby, the doctors were there, but it's not. And that's one of the issues that we have to take it. And the next speaker is my friend, Gloria Davila. So I'm finished with my friend. Gloria is going to be here in the mustache. Okay, I'm sorry. So <laughs> Sanchez has the next few slides, and he's going to take over now. Thank you, Julia. So Julia's been talking about uh, you know, a livable community. So 
So I'm going to talk briefly about what a livable community you know, incorporates. What components are a part of the livable community? A livable community is one that has some of these things in it. Affordable and appropriate housing, supportive community services, adequate mobility options, which together facilitate personal and independence and engagement of residents in civic and social life. So some of the related you know, initiatives include com combating isolation and providing resources and support to caregivers, encouraging social inclusion through volunteerism, demonstrating respect for culture, culture and ethnic diversity, promoting the use of personal technology. Now, one of the things that, that ARP is doing, you know, we're working in the community, you know, trying to work in the community every single day. When I'm talking about uh, you know, personal technology, ARP is offering classes, two classes a month, you know, on how to use your smartphone, your, uh, uh, your iPad, or your tablet. These classes are free. You do not have to be a member of ARP. And they're being held in two locations right now. The first location is at the Pearl, which is uh, at the San Antonio Area Foundation. And we have two classes, uh, you know, every month there. And then the other area we're serving, is doing these classes, or at the Guadalupe Theater. We're having two classes there. The next class is going to be on the 23rd of this month, which is on a Saturday. And uh, it, one's in the morning and the other in the afternoon. The reason we're doing it on Saturdays this time is because you know, we want to make sure that we include other people that, that can't make it during the week because uh, they're working. So, you know, all this demonstrates a connection the between... Number? What's the phone number? <laughs> the phone number... You, uh, the address. The address is at the... Oh, both of them. Okay, I'll give it to you right after. No, it, everybody will know it. Okay. That's what you're here for. I don't have the addresses, well, I'm sorry. Are you coming after you want No, I think the Guadalupe Cultural Arts. Are you going to one Guadalupe? I know, but he's supposed to know. Okay. He's a, he's I don't know. <laughs> oh, well. I don't know. For us. Okay. Well, don't shoot us. And the time, you need to tell us the time. Okay. You know, we can get you information. Joe is just trying yeah. to demonstrate. Yes, I have information. You should get all the information. I'm and trying to whet your appetite so that you can ask questions <laughs> like that. So see me right after Good. class and we'll go ahead and talk about it. Again? <laughs> so why is ARP creating this? simple information right now. So why is ARP creating this network? The ARP network of age-friendly communities encourages communities like San Antonio, as Julie was mentioning, to prepare for the rapid aging of the U.S. population by paying increased and special attention to the environmental, economic, and social factors that influence the health and well-being of older adults. All the things that you're talking about today and that you'll be talking about later on today or later on this afternoon. The network serves as a catalyst to educate, encourage, promote, and recognize improvements that make communities more supportive, not only to their older residents, but to residents of all ages. Later on today, we'll be having an exercise where, you know, it's about a listening post and, and asking questions. What, how would you make San Antonio an even better place to live? So we'll go through that later on this afternoon. And so we're creating the network to provide cities, towns, counties, with the resources they need to become more age-friendly, tapping into national and global research and, uh, you know, and best practices. So we're creating this network to enhance ARP's existing and extensive network in community outreach and advocacy in livable communities. So a city that's built for you know, people that are 80 years old is also good for, for, for younger people, you know, people that are 8 years old or something. So, through the Department of this initiative, through the development of this initiative, the World Health Organization has identified eight domains that support active and healthy aging in the community. The first one is outdoor spaces and buildings. This is accessibility to and availability to safe recreational facilities. Transportation, safe and affordable models of private and public transportation. Housing, wide range of housing options for older residents aging in place, and other modification programs. Social participation, access to leisure and cultural events, activities for older residents to participate in social and civic engagement with their peers and younger people. Respect and social inclusion, programs to support and promote ethnic and cultural diversity 
along with the programs to encourage multi-generational multi -generational interaction and dialogue. These are all things that San Antonio is already doing. You know, we, you know, different things like the MLK March, the Cesar Chavez March, you know, the Fiesta activities. We have the Institute of Texas Culture. You know, another component of the eight domains is civic participation and employment, promotion of paid work and volunteer activities for older residents and opportunities to engage in formulation of policies relevant to their lives. Communication and information, the promotion of and access to the use of technology to keep older residents connected to their community and friends and family, both near and far. And the last one, of course, is community support and health services, access to home care services, clinics, and programs to promote wellness and active aging. Now, these eight domains are not, I didn't list them in any, any particular order. This is something that you all determine, you know, at, at some point in time, which, which are the most important to you guys. So these domains have much in common with ARP policies and initiatives, particularly those that contribute to our definition of a local community. Because of this, age-friendly communities, your programs provide a framework to engage local officials and, all, and other stakeholders. So, um, you know, what are the benefits? The benefits of member communities are, there are opportunities to encourage local residents businesses, and other NGOs to play an active role. A connection to global and national networks of participating communities, as well as aging and civil society experts. So you have access to the latest news, guidance, best practices, models, results, and challenges in age-friendly movement, in the age-friendly movement. There are opportunities for partnerships with other communities, both domestic and overseas, and you get mentoring, assessments, and peer evaluations by experts and members, cities and towns. And there is recognition, of course, by AARP and the World Health Organization of the community's commitment to become a more age-friendly city. So, how does a city become age-friendly? Well, there is an enrollment process, and Julia talked about this earlier. The enrollment through the engagement and support of the ARP offices, either a mayor or a chief executive officer. You know, in our case, uh, Mayor Gospital was the one that uh, you know was in contact with us. Uh, ARP advises the World Health Organization of communities joining ARP's network and receives membership in the World Health Organization's global network. So then there is a plan. There are three phases. The first one is a planning phase. It's a one to two year uh, thing. It establishes mechanisms of involving older people in all stages of the age friendly cities and communities process. You know, like advisory committees, the you know, citizens group. You know, we conduct a comprehensive and inclusive baseline assessment of the age friendliness of the community. We develop a three year community wide action plan based on assessment findings. We identify indicators to uh, monitor progress against this plan. Phase two is the implementation itself. We commit to implementing the approved plan and submit a progress report at the end of five years that outlines progress against the baseline using the indicators developed in the action plan. And the final phase is the continual improvements. We make continual improvements. Membership is automatically renewed following a positive assessment and submission of the revised plan. So those are the, the network milestones. So, there, as of right now, there are 13 plus communities, I think, that are uh, in the network. As you can see in, in, you know, on the chart, uh, three of them are located here in, in Texas, and of course the largest is San Antonio as of right now. We have Austin, San Antonio, and Brownsville. Uh, and we have other cities, of course, that are in, you know, in line uh, to become that, so you know, we are really very proud of having San Antonio as being part of the age friendly network. Uh, okay, great. Thank yeah. you, Joe. Yeah. So, yeah. so the kitchen is going to shut down in a few minutes. So you're more than welcome to serve seconds. They do have some extra servings if anyone would like seconds. Okay. So, 
Yeah. And these typically get, as I mentioned earlier, part of our network of age friendly community. It does include a website where people can go and gather additional information from those who are already part of the network and conferences and other experts that have reports that deal with age friendly communities or communities that are 50 plus. Um, what do we bring to the table when it comes to this particular type of initiative? Um, we, will, we, we think we bring a lot, but uh, part of that would be like transportation resources, programs, and tactics. So for example, complete streets legislation. We did, we were part of that as far as just signing off and then making sure that our members supported that when the city passed their complete streets ordinance back in 2011. Um, we do have what we call a public transportation toolkit, which really is it's a toolkit that exists of expertise from around the country. We do a lot of investment to ensure we've got the proper research, because if anybody, everyone knows around the table, you could go in front of council and tell them, we need you know, new drainage, you could say, because it's uglier, because there was danger, but unless you've got statistics, unless you've got research, you're not, your argument's not gonna go really, really far. It just it arms you with that necessary information to make uh, those changes. Uh, we also have a public policy institute of research. So again, we, we have our own uh, PhDs that sit up in DC and do a lot of research on our behalf to ensure we're armed with those reports and information. <coughs> we also have driver safety classes. These are not classes necessarily that you go to get a ticket because uh, you got a ticket and you need to take a defensive driving course. This is really about driving at the age of 50 plus, because things do change somewhat, and particularly our vision. So this class has a lot of information for individuals around that. Uh, we also do pedestrian safety audits. In fact, with this group, Carlos and others, we did a safety audit off of 24th in Culebra, and we wrote it up and found a lot of, there's a lot of danger, particularly for folks who are coming out of that HEV, trying to come back into the neighborhood, Crossing 24, there really isn't, I mean, you have to walk pretty far to get to a light where then it's a safety zone for you to cross. Um, and then it doesn't really make sense because you have this uh, a bus stop. Well, in order to get to the bus stop, you gotta walk, you know, half a block or so, cross the street, come back down, and if you're 50 plus or if you're 80, that might be a little difficult, and particularly in our heat. So that's just to kind of give you some, some ideas. We also do transit training and what we call active living workshops. And we also have housing resources programs and tactics. Uh, we have information around inclusive home design, and we, we actually take these ideas and this research to hopefully impact legislation in all those, you know, national, state, and, and local. Um, we do have some national staff expertise, or a lot of national staff expertise. Uh, we do some classes called, or actually we do some, some reporting called Home Fit. Um, and what that Home Fit does is like what Julia was alluding to. Perhaps if we went to her house and we did this checkup, this home fit checkup, we might find that it doesn't pass because the doors aren't wide enough. Or maybe there's excessive steps going up to her home. For someone who may be 50, you know, someone who may be, you know, maybe 50 plus or older, right, it may not be suitable. Um, I like to say I hurt my ankle some time ago and um, it was really, really difficult. Life was horrible because you all of a sudden then realize I can't work. I heal no more, I can't get up the steps at work, I have to get to work like 30 minutes before. <laughs> but uh, you, know, you realize that when things happen with your body, you all of a sudden, those little things make a big difference. Um, we also have a foreclosure hotline. And that's really because, particularly around 2008, so about 2012, 13, maybe even current, folks were having issues with mortgages, when the downturn of the economy particularly hit hard. So we wanted to make sure people knew what they could do. Because a lot of folks just assume, I can't pay it, that's it, it's over, I gotta move out so much for the 10 years I lived here. Well, not necessarily. There's a lot of information that people need to realize or, or need, to, need to have in order to make good decisions. Um, we also uh, have a social, a social environment we feel that we bring to the table, like, for example, we're very active with uh, campaigns of voter guide and candidate forums. We are nonpartisan. We do not support candidates. What we do is work on issues. But we're going to tell you, for example, if there is a, a congressional race going on, or even a mayoral race. We may talk to the new mayoral candidates coming for the next election, and we may ask them about what they feel about age-friendly age-friendly designation. 
and ask them both the same questions and let them answer, and then provide those answers to you. Uh, you can a pamphlet, you can the internet, so people can make a decision. This candidate hates age friendly, I don't know which candidate would hate age friendly, but they don't want this, or they think it, you know, it's not high in priority, or you know, this candidate you know, favors it, loves it, wants to you know, figure out how to work cohesively with the community and with the network. Um, so just to give you an example, we also do them for Social Security, for example, that's a huge issue for us, uh, making sure at the Congressional District level you understand where your candidates lie on Social Security. You know, do, you know, are they, do they want to prioritize it, or do they want to keep it as is and strengthen it for the future? Those kind of things. Um, we also provide local discounts. Now, we are working on this in San Antonio. We have a lot of discounts if you're an HRP member, so for example, the one my, my parents love, who are Latino, who are 70 plus, is Outback Steakhouse. They go there, they get 50% off. Any day, any time. Which is nice. 15, one five, Outback Steakhouse. There's this chain of every time I'm on it. Uh, probably the closest one here. Do you know where to go? How will you go? I'm sorry? Do you know where to go? I'm not sure, so I think that's pretty individual. I think we can talk online. I'm sorry. Uh, we are also working on local discounts, for example. Currently, we're working with uh, the Cortez family. We're working to see whether or not we can get local discounts at their particular restaurants. And then I'm happy to report that uh, Joe and I worked really, really hard. Um, and we actually um, will have discounts to San Antonio Spurs for those individuals who want to attend the games for our members. Designated games and designated discounts. Now, we have to, this is a lot of work. There is a lot of rules at ARP, the things you can and cannot do. Joe and I work for the advocacy outreach piece, the nonprofit that does that. Not the foundation, but the C4 that can work and advocate on your behalf. So when we're, look, when we're looking at local discounts, we, there are, you can only take them in short dosages. We can't have a spurs discount, for example, all season long. We can only do it on a quarterly basis at the most three times a quarter. But the, we are trying this. That will, that's to come in October. A few beans, a week in October and two beans in November, where the Spurs will give us our 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 members will be seeing anywhere between 25 and 40 percent off, and it depends on the beans. But we have done that instead of we're just we're beginning to work on that, and we're talking to Lindsay's Mexican restaurant, and we're talking to other local. Uh, other local stores uh, and restaurants. And just so you know, we do have research. So when you say, why do you always go to restaurants? Why do you always go with the rental cars? We have research that indicates, consumer research that indicates what our members are spending their money on. Okay, so just kind of keep that ahead. We are working hard. Those are harder to pull locally than they are to do nationally. Uh, so again, like Joe and I are to be- Like I told you where I go on the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Uh, like Danny's, you know, how many people are, are, I mean, you can go to Danny's and can go to Danny's. You know, they don't have transportation, they need to go to another bus. How about the restaurants are here, uh, here in San Antonio, and they go where people can walk and go over there and just come. I mean, you have to Danny's and James and stuff like that, and they're far away. Well, that's great. We all definitely keep that in mind, and like I said, we're trying. I guess Lisa would be maybe the closest to here. We are, you know, going to try to work something out with her. And again, you have to understand the business has to be willing to want to work with us to provide the discount, and not all businesses want to do that. that that's up and foremost. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, I can share one experience. I, I uh, a year ago, I didn't carry a cell phone for. Until about a year and a half ago, and it's consumer cellular. And the only reason I chose it is because it was an ARP endorsed product. And I'm, I'm like real satisfied with it. Uh, the service and the price is uh, very affordable. But I think that, and, and so one time I did drop it, and uh, you know, I was able to tell me that I'm an ARP, I'm, I'm here because I took care of it. You have a new one, sir. <laughs> so uh, I believe in what ARP is doing in terms of. Endorsing certain products to make it easier for uh, you know for us to trust that it's a good product and a good service. I've been a member of ARP a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Never been, but uh, I'm talking with Gerald speaking. I'm older. I'm 70, 71. So if I don't have a transportation to get all those places, and the Cisco. We, we, we definitely you know, would like that input, we definitely will document that, we would like you to document it too, because we're going to give you a piece of paper just yes. to do that. Um, uh, what we can do as consumers when we go to those little restaurants, <clears throat> ask them to 
work with AARP so that they know that that's something that we're looking for. You know, that's very powerful, Laura, and that makes perfect sense because you are the member. So it is different if I go in there with my shirt, I'm a staffer, and they're like, yeah, yeah, you just want it. <laughs> but something like that is very powerful because she is a member, and she is requesting, I'd love for you to have some kind of discount Whatever day of the week, yeah, for the membership. And there's a lot of that. There's 130,000 you could say that to. So absolutely, that would be extremely helpful because then it would make me enticed. Because like I said, not all businesses are interested. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Um, and I'm just going to, we're running out of time, but I don't want to cut too much into your day. So uh, civic participation and employment. You know, we do so much work around that as well. For example, well, we do a lot of our work around that volunteerism. The ARP couldn't do what it does in its communities without its volunteers, like the ones here. And I was, I in error, Carlos Gonzalez, because he's wearing a green shirt today, not a good one. I, that was one of our RV uh, volunteers as well. It does a magnificent, magnificent job. Uh, but we also have a, a different volunteers, community volunteers that just you know, maybe you want to do an event with us and hand out bags or hand out information, or maybe you just want to give out other guides. So we've got a slew of volunteers and we've got different types of roles for volunteers. Uh, we've got volunteers that go visit with their congressman or woman, and uh, well, I don't have you over here, but you know, we've met, we've got, what, they're working on that. Red and Ribbon, she talks about the series, you know, Social Security, Medicare, so this is what it needs to be, and so we've got roles like that. Um, and then tax aid, like VITA, tax aid, we are focused on the 50 plus, we will not turn anyone down if they come into the different, uh, the different nonprofits that we're in or our own volunteer center, but we do work on taxes for people for free. Uh, they do have to be so pretty simple, we can't do any type of, uh, you know, like small business or whatnot, but we uh, do, do that as a service as well. Um, also around community support and health services, and I'll talk a little bit about ACA education. We did a lot of that last year. As you know, it was the first time we were, you know, the enrollment in Obama Care, Affordable Care Act, however you'd like to refer to it, took place. And we wanted folks just to have the facts of what the ACA was. What does it mean to you? And we, did, we partnered with the National Housing Authority last year, and we went around and we talked to a lot of folks at the different developments. People assume that you know they don't need insurance, nobody works, but that's not the case. People do work. And there are you know the children need to be taken care of, and you know, the older community need to be taken care of on Medicare and whatnot, Medicaid. Um, but you don't you have a lot of parents that are working that don't have insurance. So we went out there just to let them know, not to sell anything, but to let them know this is what it is. This is, you may fall, you may or may not qualify, but we want you to be aware that it's mandated. We want you to be aware of what will happen. We want you to be aware how they're going to find you, you know, to make sure that if you don't get insurance, how are you going to have to pay for not having insurance? So we went out there to educate, uh, basically, uh, the, the community uh, in partnership with a whole bunch of folks. We were just a little piece of that. Um, we have a lot of caregiver resources. Caregiving is a big issue. Um, I think people don't realize that there may be caregivers and they're like, yeah, I just hear my mom, but I mean, I'm not like, I don't work anymore, I don't have 10 people. Well, you're a caregiver. And, and I have not been, well, I've been a caregiver to my children, that was not our job, but I have not been a caregiver to my mom yet, uh, or, my, or my parents, or anyone, but the stories that you hear, the stress that it involves, and probably more of you in the audience can speak to that than I could, but we have a lot of resources that is, that is that's helpful. We have partnerships, for example, with Caregiver SOS. Uh, here in San Antonio that do a wonderful job of really trying to bring what they call risk of care to caregivers. And it really is about taking care of the caregiver. It really is about time away from your loved one. Um, thank you, well, who am I going to leave my loved one with? There's resources available for that. Uh, where there's lots of nonprofits that will come and take care of your loved one or to you go grocery shopping and whatnot. And just how to relieve some of that, again, stress and particularly <coughs> to share that with anyone. <laughs> Okay, so what are the next steps of discussion? We put this up here. Uh, I think that we were going to visit with our new mayor, Ivy Taylor. Um, Ivy is a city planner, as most of you know. I worked, had the opportunity to work with Ivy when I was at the city of San Antonio a, year, a few years ago. Um, well, a couple years ago. And I worked on a revitalization project in Fort Sam. I only say that to say real life affecting type of work is important to Ivy. Quality of life issues. How many dogs? Can you go out and walk? 
my, your sidewalk's broken, that, that you know, she cares about those kind of things. So we have it, you guys have the discussion. We are meeting with her staffer um, to discuss just the designation, what it means, where we are, hopefully give her support. But I'm very confident that it fits right within her agenda. Um, and again, she's already come back to say that she cares about additional resources for community, sidewalks and streets, and, and, and so forth. So that's a really good thing. Uh, we've also been conducting several listening posts throughout the city. Uh, Joe and I have been part of over like, 10 community events. Uh, all the Cico Villa was one of them, Palo Alto Festival was another, and many, many more. Where we're talking, where we have people coming to our booths or exhibits, and we're talking to them, and we're asking that question, which we're going to ask you to write down, or we're going to ask you the question and ask you to write down your response. What would you do to make San Antonio an even better city? And we phrase that question because we realize there's been a lot of improvement already because of your work and because of the work in general that's going on throughout, whether it's nonprofits, whether it's the state government, uh, whether it's the county, there's been a lot of increases within San Antonio, and we recognize that, and we want to respect that work. We're, you can always make things better, so we're, that's the question we're asking. What would you do to make it even a better uh, city? Um, we're also building a volunteer team, people who are interested in the work that we're doing around each friendly. It's a lot. There's, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of components. Uh, but we, I, we, know we have a lot of experts in the neighborhood that you know, nobody knows the neighborhood better than you do. We know we have a lot of organizations so that have a lot of expertise. Um, and we'd love to, for you to become part of this coalition. So, you know, if you're interested, please see me after or any one of the volunteers. Uh, we're also hosting community conversations around the city, like this one. This one's our first one. Our next one's going to be at Mission Branch Library on September 18th. And we're going to the different sectors of the city. And we're going to the different sectors of the city because we want input from a variety of folks. But we're, that is not going to be the only type of input we'll be seeking and receiving. We're also going to be conducting a survey. When I say we, not necessarily Joe and I are going to be doing that, but we'll have some experts doing that for us. Uh, to make, and all this information really goes into our plan that we're trying to formulate so that we can go back to the city and say, after all of these conversations, after all of this input in San Antonio, the two overarching priorities, or one overarching priority is, for example, parks. People that care about open spaces and parks. And I only say that because, again, Joe and I have been listening to posts and we analyze the information. And the, so far, and this is not to drive what, you know, how you feel about this community, this is just to kind of give you that information. So far, the top three are cultural events. We want more cultural events. Cultural events, parks and open spaces, employment for the 50 plus. Those are the three so far that we're in that order that we've been seeing that people feel are more, most important to them to have a even better policy model. And, and then, so there's a, if you need more information, but I do have cards as well. I'm going to hand this now over to Gloria Davila, who's going to start a conversation. Gloria? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get my pad here. <laughs> I'm Gloria Dobby. I'm the one that you've been seeing on TV. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> that was a major effort. We did it out at uh, the Wellington Cultural Arts Center, and it was a hot day. I was in the sun all day, and um, I've got glaucoma, so I shouldn't be out in the sun, but I was. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot of fun. We had um, people from Washington, D.C. that came down and did the, uh, the little, well, actually they built hundreds and hundreds of feet, uh, and they narrowed it down to 30 seconds. But um, they were very patient, very professional, and out of all those hundreds of feet of film, they narrowed it down to 30 seconds. <laughs> the, best, the best that I did, so that's how it came out. But it was a lot of fun, and I was really glad to do it. But as a, as a AARP volunteer, I have learned a lot about what uh, AARP does for the community. My husband Alex, he's been an AARP volunteer for about 22 years. So he's got the knowledge, he's got uh, a lot of the history. And um, when we married, I became an ARP volunteer. And so we have done a lot of things together. And we have done a lot of things together with Lisa and Joe. And as we go out into the community, 
we listen to other people. We have face to face conversations, we have face to face um, arguments, we have face to face discussions because we really do want to hear. And Alex and I really appreciate the direction that ARP is taking because now there is a major effort to be more inclusive. They are reaching out to our community. For example, they selected San Antonio being, uh, to be one of these uh, age-friendly communities. And so what, what we see is that they're putting out the effort to come in and invite us and to embrace us. And as you can see, Alex is Hispanic, um, uh, Julie is Hispanic, so am I, and so are these two guys. So we want to be to be the faces of AARP, and that's where we're going. Part of the other thing is this age-friendly community. And so when, when Alex and I go out, and we all go out to the different events, we've done uh, the Toronto Community Festival. I don't, remember, I don't know if you were there that you came to our booth. And we had many, many, many treats and, and little gifts with people. We're always doing that. We went to the Sigrovia, or Sigrovia, so people pronounce it that way. We did uh, the Palo Alto College Festival. We've done the ACA at the Market Square downtown. And so when we do that, we actually, you know, I usually stand like this, and here's the person, and I talk to them face to face, and say, what are you needing? What would you like to tell me? And so we ask them, what is it? It's a community conversation, but personally. And so we want to know what the issues are. I know this gentleman right here, Yodoro, he's the first name, he's like my dad, Yodoro, um, that we listen to what they're saying. And he's talking about discounts, and we understand that. So we take everything back, and this is what we're going to do right now, is to listen to you, to your feedback, write it down, and we take it back to the city, we take it back to the state, AARP office, but basically it's us listening to you. What we're doing is turning outward. We're, we don't want to tell you, oh, these are your issues. No, we want to hear you to see what it is that you think is important and what it is that you're going to uh, um, consider as part of these eight domains of liv livability. As we have gone out, I have heard, and, and I, 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 I wrote it down because it was very uh, emotional for me. Um, I met a lady at the Palo Alto College Festival, and she said that she loved what had been done to 24th Street. You know, the street that is uh, in front of our Native the Lake University. And she said, it is beautiful. It provides a sense of security to the students crossing it, that they are safe. She said, why can't we have something like that it's on our street? I don't have an answer for that. But that is part of the major effort of one of the domains that we talk about. Then I had another gentleman that spoke to me, and he talked to me in Spanish, and he said, see if I can read it without getting emotional. <clears throat> he said, cuando llueve bastante, el agua llega hasta la puerta del tren. No tiene que ser así. ¿Por qué no nos ayuda la ciudad? In Spanish. Why don't they help us? I mean, when they tell you things like this, you know, you get a response. However, what are we going to do? Once again, AARP doesn't have all the money in the world to provide the transportation that this gentleman is asking for. It does not. Can you say what you said in English? Or English oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it says, when it rains a lot, it says that the, the water comes up to our front door. It says it doesn't have to be that way. Why doesn't the city help us? I don't have an answer for that, and neither does ARP. But as a collective effort, and finding out what it is that you need like things like this, then then we together, like all the gentlemen and, and, and ladies that have spoken here this morning, that's how we do it. We find out what it is that the people need. And all the things that I've heard as we went around, they talked about, some people talked about wanting more street lights, more sidewalks that can handle walkers as well as bike riders. They want swimming pools in their communities. Uh, they want safe, clean parks. And 
very, very much more substantial jobs, affordable housing, health facilities, more and better transportation. So we heard all this as we went up in the community. And if you notice, we addressed a lot of the issues in the places on the south side of town. That's what we did. And that's why I'm telling you that right now I'm proud to be an ARP volunteer because they are showing the effort. So anyway, if you know, if you look on your on your little pamphlet that we gave you, does everybody have one? Where you have the eight domains of livability. These are the uh, uh, the domains that influence the health and quality of older student adults. Health and quality for you. And that's what we want. For example, the first one is outdoor spaces and buildings. How many of you want safe and accessible recreational facilities? We all do. And that's part of this big effort that we're doing. How about transportation? This gentleman again, he talked about getting the people out to Denny's. How do you get there? And I've spoken about this to the state office ARP many times, that if you want our Hispanic population or any population to be able to participate, what do they need? Well, they're not going to be able to transfer or have two big transfers in the bus. So how do we get them there? Again, AARP cannot do it alone, but as a concerted effort, we can. If you look at the housing, once again, Alan is older than I am, and so, but we want to age in place. That means that I, he doesn't want to be in a nursing home, and neither do I. And I think in the Hispanic culture, we don't allow our parents to be in a nursing home. My mom died when she was 92, and we took care of her at home. Never did we ever think of putting her in a nursing home. That's what we mean, age in place. We want the housing, affordable housing, and, and, and other different kinds of, of uh, home modification programs that we need. Social participation, this is what Lisa was talking about. Um, social and civic engagement with peers and younger people. Judy gave you a lot of information, statistics about how old we're getting, but how many nephews, nieces, sons, daughters do you have? that are really young, that think totally different from us. Eventually, there's going to be a big gap. You're going to have all this big population in aging with age people, older people, and then a large population with younger people. I have a daughter and a granddaughter. A granddaughter is totally raised totally different than the way he was raised. We have this conversation because it's an intergenerational I don't want to say problem, but per perhaps issue, because they can't talk to each other. He can't understand why she gets up at noon. He's up at 5.36, and he says, how can she sleep so late? Then all the kids are there to dinner. We go out to dinner, and some of you I see that are going, that's where she is the whole time. He cannot understand. So there's an intergenerational disconnect right there. So somewhere along the line, when we talk about the uh, uh, civic engagement and social engagement with peers and younger people, we're going to have to do that. That's part of one of the, these domains. The um, respect and social inclusion, promote ethnic and cultural diversity as well as multi-generation interaction and dialogue. We, I try to interject, interject generational dialogue. I try to talk to my granddaughter. Well, if you've ever talked to a, a, a teenager, 19, 20 year old, what do they do when you tell them something? They roll their eyes. I see that all the time. <laughs> Communication and information, access to technology. Once again, some of our senior citizens don't have access to computers. But in an effort to bring that to the community, that's why we're here. We find out do we really need that? intergenerational disconnect again. You know, I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPad, I've got a laptop, I've got a, a regular phone, I've got a regular desktop computer, and I'm lucky that I'm able to have those things. This man right here does not. I've got a telephone and the mail. 
Can I just interject again? Uh, because of AARP support, we and, and a grant through LULAC, uh, we have a eight computer lab here in the Frank Air Community Center. But because of ARP, we were able to get some instruction and actually open it up, especially for the seniors. Since Raul Garza got here as center director, it's now being uh, utilized and is much more effective. Uh, he's, we've got some Trinity interns that, again, it's got to be scheduled for, for those of us that uh, may want a you know, two, three year kind of a, a individualized tutoring. But uh, again, that same, because not everybody wants to. But, but those that do, we, we now have to be able to offer that uh, on a limited basis here at the Frank Center. Yeah. Where are you? I'm sorry? Where are you? What are you reading? This, this, this thing right Oh, here? you didn't get one. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering where you're reading from. Oh, these are just my notes that I wrote. From, and that's... From my head, this doesn't make sure I didn't miss anything. So that's yeah. not part of the yeah. ARP region's program? Or you mean the technology? No, what the whole thing you've been reading. Oh yes, this is what we're talking about. The 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 that this is an effort to promote these uh, uh, these different areas in our community. They're very good to do that. They're her experiences. That's yeah. the very mm -hmm. cool thing about it. <laughs> and and the last one is community supported health services, access to home care services. We've talked about that. So. All these ideas that we've heard that you probably have in your mind, that I hope you have in your mind right now, all are probably grouped under one of these. The transportation is here. The uh, recreational facilities is here. And so at this point, I, I'm going to stop talking and ask you to provide some feedback. You tell us what it is that you think will make San Antonio a better community. Okay. On the physical fitness, uh, well, like like in, like in, in Danish, you know, the ARP doesn't give any go to different like the YM, YMCA, or different uh, uh, retail that have physical equipment for the seniors to go out there and do the physical. Fitness. I go to the Y because my physical I had a colon cancer five years ago, and uh, particularly every senior. Uh, we had the insurance paid for your, and it for a for the for the wine. Now they cut out that stuff, and some of, and I'm lucky that and it's only basically it's only fifteen dollars and fifty cents per month as the rate. But to some seniors, it's too much. You sure is. I agree with that. They quit going. However, I and they more and they need more because their their health issues. Or more in mind. I know that uh, a YMCA, uh, uh, the ones that we have uh, uh, a connection to, they don't provide this. Well, they, they all of them don't because I'm they, would, they would be able to survive if they provided this. Thing. So I, it's like Lisa was talking about that if there is a possible business organization entity that does not want to do that, then ARP is not going to do that. The so. Silver Snickers also was. But now they dropped it and they cut everything. And you know what? And but those are the insurance companies. Yes, and that's not. I'm okay, saying maybe, maybe that the ARP company. can go to some somewhere, some down the line, and get maybe get a discount like the dentist does. Well, I did. I wrote it down, and just so you'll know, with the YMCA, we had discussions about that, and they're looking because they already offer a senior discount. So we're trying to get more, and so why we don't want to offer a discount that's identical to what they already offer. We want more to make it different, more appealing. We're just working with them. And then also, so you know, because you brought up physical activity, I just so everybody's aware, we also are working with the academy. They've been very slow. Again, it's, it's a process they've got to get approved. Do they really want this? If they do it here in San Antonio, they're going to have to do it in Austin and in Dallas. And if they do it there, they're probably going to have to do it in New York, you know, if they exist there. Whatever that is, they've got to think about their business and whether it makes sense. It's a business. That's kind of the difficulty of working with businesses or profits in particularly, or even nonprofits, because like Gloria alluded to, they gotta look at do they break even, can they cover their costs? So we are working on that and I know it's slow to come, but uh, the discounts we try to get are always gonna be better than what they already have. Because they that's the first thing they told us, YMCA, we already have a discount. That's what it is. I'm sorry, check. 
Yeah, um, the focus that, that this meeting is about today is about neighbors helping neighbors. Mm -hmm. Is AARP positioned where you could help us in some of our the things that we're doing in this neighborhood? We've got an aging population. We've got a lot of housing problems in the neighborhood. Um, open spaces, side, sidewalks are both issues here that we're going to be addressing. Um, transportation, you know, we, I, we have a term, we kind of stole it, it's called landlocked. You know, a lot of people won't leave their neighborhood here, you know, to go to, go to another neighborhood, even up to the family uh, the neighborhood place, sure. you know, to, to use some of the resources up there. Food insecurity. You know, it's a big issue that I don't see in the eight, dom eight domains. I don't understand that. You know, where is where is in food insecurity? In that? You know, it's a real problem. One of the other things, you know, the, uh, there's a time dollar program which can address a lot of the gaps. The government's not going to be able to do all this. You know, we're already seeing continual cutbacks especially at the city level in terms of human services. And so, you know, I, it's going to have to be neighbors helping neighbors and groups like this that are going to be doing the work of getting neighbors out, helping their neighbors, you know, and some other options for transportation. You know, the Time Dollar program would be one way of doing that. You've got somebody with a car, and somebody who needs a ride, you hook them up. And, and they get, you know, they get time credit for it. So, you know, is there something that AARP can do to help us? Well, can you go over here? I mean, first of all, I want to make you aware about the age-friendly designation that the city has. We want to make you aware that there's a plan being formulated. Uh, when you're looking, for example, and I know Carlos is, is an expert at this, but when you're looking at a need in your community, for example, sidewalks and streets, and you're going in front of a counselor or councilwoman or man to talk about that, mm -hmm. Knowing that the, if the city is already designated an age friendly city, that it's part of SA 2020, whether you like the program or, or not, these are adopted plans. That is actually ammunition for you to use when you're talking and discussing. And there are, there in some cases, we have taken uh, actual positions on some local policy. That we do, we would have to guide you. I'm going to be really clear we need to guide whether or not we could do something like that for the organization. But the age friendly, actually, the designation, once it gives you an additional voice, because I know you have a, a big voice as a community, and that's a great thing, but it gives you additional voice and an additional plan to say, look, we're in here, we're in there, we're in here. Come on, what, what else can you throw at us? We know for sure, you know, we visit with so-and-so, we visit with so-and-so, we know there's funds here. I mean, a lot of what you've done with linear parks and whatnot. So how we can help you, we can convene. We've got expertise that we need to try to figure out if it's an ordinance we want to craft. You know, that's a, that's a big, you know, you have to get more than just one side of town, right? That wants something change. But as a convener, sharing our resources, uh, I'm not, we, there's no way we have money to do, you know, fix the sidewalk for a neighborhood. There's just no way, right? Because if you were like, well, it might be whether it's getting into an influencer's office, which I know a lot of y'all already have that access, or crafting the policy or or helping to organize those are things that we're, we want to be a partner with in the community but you're right we're not going to be able to do it it's the coalition it's about making this foundation available and letting you know what you know instead of keeping it to ourselves and just advertising it whatever we wanted to or working with just significant you know other groups it's about making sure people are aware of it and how it can best benefit your community like you said you know, we're age friendly. Sixty-five percent of our population, councilwomen, councilmen, are you know are fifty plus, and this says that we need to have complete streets. We don't have that. Um, we have an ordinance, but look what it's doing. Look what it has in there. So those kind of it, it helps with those bond meetings that you're going to have down the road, right? That part of that civic engagement is being aware of what resources are available. And I'll just say, when I worked for the city of San Antonio, I co-chaired the Parks and Rec. Bond community. Um, we had lots of organizations there, very little public participation, very little residents. They were all organizations that were seeking money. So really, <clears throat> residents are empowering those organizations to make the, their decisions on their behalf. And let's, uh, we've got great, tremendous nonprofits in the city, but we didn't have any public participation. So who's, how do you, you're leaving it up to somebody else to represent your needs. 
So I, I just encourage you, like this type of stuff can just be very empowering and give you that opportunity to, to have a platform to speak from. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, something I might be able to help with, and kind of a law enforcement is I have a big problem in this area with a lot of seniors who do use banks. And it's a big problem with that years up here because they go cash their check and they get out of their money right there in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And we try to get banks out here before we talk to them that it's a safe deal that the debit card is money. A lot of, a lot of us don't understand that. Maybe y'all don't do that. Some, but they, they, what they do is go to the bus stop after they count the money, somebody steals the money. Mm -hmm. Did they charge you for the cash? Did they charge something for the cash? Yeah. Some place sure they, they do. do. Yeah. You're talking yeah. about that they go home with that. No, with that they, they, don't, they don't trust banks. They don't want the bank. They've never had a bank account. They oh. go to the HP, they cash their money, check it in. They count, count the money right there. They walk out to the bus stop, somebody takes their money. Or, a lot, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people in the area have 40 and 50 year old sons who refuse to work still. <laughs> and they go in there and they take the money from mom because mm -hmm. she has the cash. So, yeah. if, we, if y'all can help get the word out about debit cards, then they can take their money and they yeah. steal the money. <laughs> and we we do we've got some some information around that because the actually social security checks are supposed to be directly deposited to a bank. Period. I mean, very little very little paper checks are actually coming out to people. I mean, it should almost be like that's not even happening because again, it costs so much money for them to produce those checks. We have information to educate people around, you know, this is how you can use your debit card, these are the fees, or these are you know, not the fees. Generations Federal Credit Union does a really, really great job of not charging, and particularly focused on Social Security uh, a service fee. But we do have information that we can continue to pour out into the communities, um, get it through Carlos, get it through the churches, you know, we can figure out how to get some information to them. But also, we have some uh, fraud prevention uh, <coughs> materials. We have a campaign going on right now where we're talking to not just 50 plus, we're talking to, we need to talk to everybody, but it's about, if there's, there's this one uh, tool that we have called the Con Artist Playbook, and it's actually a partnership we have nationally with the FBI. We actually talk to con artists and they tell us what they look for, they tell us why they do the things they do. That's a really, actually great uh, tool and we'll make sure to get you some. In fact, I believe Julia is going to be here next week. Uh, it's a week from Friday, we're going to do a uh, workshop at the nutrition site. And I'll have, I'll have all of that. Right here? Yeah. Okay. So there is going to be a fraud presentation and some of that entails banking. So there are, maybe we can bring additional information so that people are more aware. And we talked to you about how people might be waiting right outside for you when you're catching that chat. And they're talking to you because maybe, you know, they figure maybe you might be lonely because you are 80 years old or whatever the case is. People target, right, as you know. Um, we talk a little bit about that as well. So that's good feedback, and we'll make sure to get that information out in the community. AFP also partners with the police department and the sheriff's department. In fact, we have Sheriff Pembro come out and speak. Uh, fraudulent activities against the seniors and uh, scamming, you know, and all that stuff. And so we have access to information about that. But um, what I wanted to say was that we have this partnership and we're going to be uh, doing a conference next year about that very day. And one of the things is that it is the relatives of the seniors that sometimes take advantage of, of them. And, and so we, we you know, how, how do you tell the senior that it's their son or their daughters or their nephews or grandkids that are doing that? It's really tough. And, and, and I guess you have to have a tough conversation when, when that happens. So um, it's called Try and Salt. And we have a, a police officer and a sheriff's deputy come in every month at the and we talk about things like that. So we'd love to have you come over and to right. our meeting, really. And that way you can find out what's going on over here. Well, we yes, who else has? I, I thought he was talking about people that go catch the chef and they charge them a dollar or whatever, you know, some percentage of the, of the chef for catching. And that, that always has upset me, no, no limit. <coughs> Two guy with a small chair, and he's got to pay so much for the heavy cash. Then they are one thing that they have to advocate to someone to see it. Well, the biggest problem with that is the fact they don't trust banks. 
I know that. Yeah, so that's why they'd rather do that. Some of the businesses yeah. charge them. Oh, yeah, they're going to charge them. And, and it would be better than getting the bank, but we can't get them to. I've had banks show up to me trying to get them to show them how it works in the industry. They don't touch the bank. So if, if we have more people on their age group, because me talking to someone who's 75 years old, they're going to be like, you're just a young punk, you know what I'm talking about? I'm serious, that's the way it is. So we need somebody their okay. age that has the bank account, that has the debit card that can explain to them. AFP has been for for some time now. Uh, have bringing the issue to, to, the, to, to the legislators about the uh, loan. Uh, sure. Payday, not payday. Yeah, but they loan you the money and then it keeps expanding to where you never pay pay the loan. You just keep paying. So you're trying to loan to okay. Yes, sir. With uh, ongoing city market process, uh, are you all engaged with any local officials? I'm sorry, I'm say that again. With any local officials, ongoing city budget. Uh, ongoing city market process, uh, are you all engaged with any local officials on that? With the budget itself, we're not involved at this point in going to the budget meetings and designating what's you know, we might need for each friendly. That might be, again, we're pretty new in the process, we're, we're just formulating the plan. I think it wouldn't be us going, it would actually be maybe our members and volunteers uh, going to council and then again utilizing this is part of you know, becoming age friendly, we need this part so that we can exercise or whatnot. But uh, as far as we are very involved and we have fairly good relationships with council and the mayor. Uh, but again, we don't, you know, we, we go to them, for example, to pay lending work that we were really, with your help, with this organization's help, and many others, we were able to get that ordinance passed, and we did do a lot of meetings with the council at that time. So there was something particularly issue-wise that we were working on, then we would have that direct communication with them, through our volunteers, members, and perhaps staff. But I mean, that definitely makes a lot of sense as far as the budget, because everything we're talking about here, the city can contribute a, you know, a lot to, right? Infrastructure, housing. Why did you ask? What is it? Well, yes. About loan? Well, yes, oh, the what, what, Why did you ask? Well, I, I just thought maybe that they might have been, you know. Are they working with the city? Well, I've got an idea for you to work with the city. Uh, one of your on your list was the uh, home modification, the ramps, wider doors for the bathrooms, and we've discussed that um, in previous meetings here. And uh, as you know, the city budgets are getting smaller for for housing, for social services, right? everything. So uh, there's only so much that you do. For example, in the last I thought that was uh, the last budget that was maybe room for three historic houses in the uh, city budget to fix up, and maybe a dozen homes to modify. So a suggestion would be for ARP to join with the city in going to the private business and matching what the city provides for home modification. And you can do it like the target area, you know, have a what do you call it, project? Pilot project. Uh, in this area, for example, or some other area. And so you've got uh, 200,000 for modifi modifying homes, Home Depot, Lowe's, or anybody else, any private business, Valero, and Kitchen, for another 200,000. And you can do that, you can go directly to the city and work with the city and help raise that number. That's a, that's a good suggestion. We wrote that down. Um, well, I mean, if I mean, you want to help modify homes for, for seniors, the only source is a city, and a county is a much smaller amount, but that is six county area, so you, you, it's impossible to do it. So the only other one is the city, so if you want to help, let's help raise the money to double up and get more people fixed in the house. Okay. That's a great suggestion. We took that down. And we also have a foundation, ARP Foundation, and I know that nationally, actually one of the National Policy Council members that we have, Adelardo, is coming to visit with Lourdes Castro, uh, Ramirez, before she leaves. 
uh, because he's going to be actually looking at some affordable options for the 50 plus. Now, I know that's a little different because it is a public housing for the most part, but what's really encouraging is that they chose someone to well, no look at this type of penalty and that they're realizing housing is a huge component of being friendly and a huge issue for our membership. So that's a you know, good suggestion and we're going to write that down. So I've been I've worked for lawyers for 12 years. One of the lawyers for a legal administrator was Henry Gonzalez Jr. This lady called. Her son had her sign a legal document. So then he told the mother she needed to leave and threw her out because the legal document she signed was she signed over ownership to the from the mother to the son. So what can you do? There was a legal document. So maybe you can have the seniors know that this has been done and that they might have legal aid for somebody to help them before they sign any legal document. That's good. So Happens more often than we think. Huh? Yeah. Happens more often than we think. Oh, yes. Power of attorney. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, because of this national conversation, I, I'm real supportive of uh, uh, ARP's concerted effort to increase participation from minority communities uh, by doing a bunch of stuff that's already been mentioned here. I had the pleasure of uh, being at a, at a booth at Palo Alto College. Everybody has fiesta events, and in the last two years, there's been one alcohol-free, friend, family-friendly at, at Palo Alto College, and and we do this kind of stuff. We just get people up to attend and talk about ARP's initiatives and where we're at at Medicare and that sort of thing. So I think it a uh, culturally relevant and friendly where people are already gathered. Then this year. Uh, ARP co-sponsored the Tejano Conjunto Festival. And again, you know, we had a huge event, and it was a big crowd, and you know, Lily earlier mentioned her role as cops, but uh, that whole uh, venue, Rosedale Park itself, was built uh, as a big project during her time of leadership. And, and for it to be utilized that way in a real, uh, I mean, it was a real nice crowd, and that's what it was built for, to have the big crowd. Uh, but I just want to commend ARP for doing those kind of works, and, and of course how that directs open action <coughs> directly. One of our first major public action was, was supporting that payday lending. I think Ms. Gary, you, you took about 65 seniors that time oh from the city hall. Um, I think we had like, two bus that were on the we had two one bus, bus that day. one from the east side and one from the east side. But uh, anyway, just maybe what we're already doing. But just keep doing it because it's bringing some, uh, so ARP some change. Was the major sponsor for the Tejano Festival. And that is just an indication of where ARP is going. Instead of them coming to us, we're going to them. And we go to the Market Square, we go to Palo Alto College, we go to the uh, Rosedale Park. We're trying to get out there to where our communities are instead of them coming to us. And that's that's what we need to remember that too. That's one of the events that we hosted. And we talk about issues that are very important to Hispanic and other minorities, the Affordable Care Act, Social Security, Medicare, um, payday lending, fraudulent activities, um, other things that I can come up with. Nursing home care, I think there was a report that just came out that ARP was really involved with uh, the Sunset Commission to make sure that, that some of the that nursing homes don't continue to, you know, uh, run up these, these bad reports and nothing gets done uh, to them about it. That at some point in time, they're going to be losing their licenses and, and it's going to be more than just a, a slap on the wrist and, and, and nothing else happening. So as a result of some of that work, you know, we're going to be able to protect our seniors a lot more uh, in those types of areas. I just want to get a little bit of clarification. This gentleman asked about food insecurity and I think I know what you're meaning, but could you explain that a little bit more? Like a food drive? No, I'm just, you know, food insecurity is a major issue, both for kids, especially for kids, but also for seniors, you know, just making, <coughs> making, helping people to get access to healthy meals. And I think that, you know, we talked about earlier, um, 
sustainable networks, mm -hmm. but neighborhoods, I think, is one way of doing it. Uh, uh, are you think I, I'm trying to to formulate something? Do we need more nutrition sites? Is that would that be one of the answers? Because what I've seen in the past years is that we're cutting back on nutrition. Yeah, I yes, I, I think that that's one of the issues that's been that's that's causing a lot of the problems is that there's been cutbacks for example, by the city and nutrition sites. You know, they're making it farther apart and it's harder to get to them. Um, but, you know, so there, there's not a lot of support for them. That's one of the issues, nutrition sites. And I, and I just think that, you know, again, that's only a part of the answer, I think. I know that the foundation has given a lot of grants in that area. The ARP Foundation, which is kind of a, like the other arm that we don't work directly with. But, and the reason I know that is I get frequent letters from them asking for contributions to this food. I forget what they call it, but they do grant some of these out there. Um, we might want to look into that. Well, well actually, I this is a great segment because I do want to, Juan was here earlier. He got a large grant from the ARP Foundation for food security. So it'd be really nice to look at some of those, uh, some of that work to see what, what, it was over a six figure grant that went to him to talk about, to, to figure out food insecurity, particularly the West Side. Um, it actually was, you know, a significant size, so it would be good to get for, or to see what has happened, what he as far as the tracking. What we could do is go back to our foundation and get the latest report, and we could provide that to the leadership of your group so that you can see what happened with that grant, what did they learn, and how was it leveraged locally. Because lots of times you've got grants, you've got money coming in, that's not, that's, it's, that's not always, we think money is the problem, you know, solver, you know, solving everything, but it's not. I mean, if we're funding something and there was some research paper or there was some, some learning, the community needs to know what that learning is. Maybe it was a list of resources. Maybe it was how do you eat better. Well, where is it? That's what we need to find out. So now, I, you know, we'll, again, what we could do is go back to our foundation and get a report of what happened, what did we learn, how was it used, so that you can then better hold those nonprofits accountable so that you get that research, you get that, take advantage of that investment that was made. But we do a lot of work, like Julia said, on hunger, particularly hunger for 50 plus, we know it exists. Um, and again, if there is an opportunity, we could always connect you with somebody who's a foundation. Yeah, and, and again, that, that, like I keep saying, that that's a piece of the sure. puzzle, and I think another piece of the puzzle <coughs> is what I'm trying to get at with my, with my comments here, is that, you know, that there has to be some policy that supports this, neighbors helping neighbors, so we can build community gardens that people can participate in and, you know, and get what, programs out. Once you get a grant that pays for the class, that you know, it's fast, bad, junk, was kind of extra, like somebody said, you don't have no right to do that to somebody. I said, if I want to, I can, but what they do with it is none of my business. It's their, it's on them, not me. <laughs> Sorry. Last year, when they were here in San Antonio, I believe, I think I'm consulting on the Paso, but Juan Flores received the grant with Buffet. And part of Yolanda Santos was also part of that grant. So. It's on the news, I've been hearing more and more national news about senior parks. Um, and I'm just wondering if maybe that's something that we need here. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, designed specifically for the needs of senior citizens, like we tend to lose our balance as we get older, so they have equipment, you know, really geared towards the physical needs of seniors and what, you know, uh, older persons can, can handle. And so I think that, you know, that would be an important piece to, uh, you know, hear locally. And then, just something else, I don't know where it really fits in at all, but I'm reading more and more, um, uh, there's new research that says that in the coming years, the group that is going, the homeless group that is going to be growing are the boomers. Uh, and I'm not quite clear why boomers are going to, to start to become uh, homeless. But anyway, um, 
I'm wondering if that's something that AARP is looking at at a national level, and I know affordable housing plays into all of that, but, um, you know, I just, I'm just kind of wondering if there's any kind of focus on that piece of it. Nationally, level, there is some focus to get you exactly what we're working on. I've heard that same conversation about homeless with boomers, and particularly those who didn't plan for their retirement. And even if they did plan, they might have lost some of their 401k because of the mm -hmm. catastrophes of 2008 and so forth. Um, and then when you tie that to demographics, to MNE community, multicultural communities like Latinos, like African Americans, it's possible that our incomes will be so low that we won't be able with the affordability or non-affordability of housing, we won't be able to either stay in it or get us, you know, continue to pay rent. So we'll get you some information around that. And then the other question was about grandparents' parks, and that is absolutely something that is taking place, and ARP has played a role, like in, for example, Wichita. We played a role uh, in bringing people up, coming, coming, and maybe it was going to the city council to, to look for funding, maybe it was trying to figure out, you know, what if, I, I'm not sure whether or not our foundation put any funds toward it, but we can definitely find out. We've got examples, and that's definitely something we can do here in San Antonio if that was a priority. I mean, you got to remember, we can probably only start with one. Sure. So the issue is always like, where is that going to be, right? So, but um, at the end of the day, that is absolutely a new trend. And you see a lot of grandparents say, I'm, not, I'm living longer. I might be 80 with a three-year-old, right? Or maybe 75 with a three-year-old. I can't lift him or her. It's going to be that sweet. But that quality of time that I'm spending, that getting out is doing great stuff for me and doing a great thing for my child or grandchild. So yes, that's that's absolutely, or a great grandchild, that's absolutely uh, something that we can bring some experience to, and then maybe even if it's a reality, somebody really wants to do that project, maybe it's a, a park that's already in the bond, that's already in the pipeline, and somebody wants to reconfigure that. Thank you to ensure that it's a grandparent's park. And what is a grandparent's park? So we can be helpful with that. Thanks for bringing that up. I'd like to do one more. Let me just get her really quick. She hasn't spoken. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, what, the nutrition classes, like how often do they occur and at what time? Yes. Oh, nutrition classes here? Uh, don't, don't you guys know? No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. You're pointing to the nutrition, nutrition, nutrition site where they serve oh. seniors on a regular basis. Oh, okay. five days a week. I think they, that's what we, they were talking about. It's true. But we don't have uh, nutrition classes per se where they teach you how to maintain unless Candy does down in the day yeah. on Mondays and I don't think she does that. Uh -uh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, one more before the last. I ride the bus every day and I uh, hear a lot of things about I mean, the seniors that are you know, problems that they have problems with the buses. The shelters, the city is spending millions and millions and millions of dollars and they're terrible. They're nice, but they don't when it's when it's raining and, it, and it's cold, they don't cover you. You cannot sit down, it, 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 not only it's metal, but the water is all wet. And during the summer, like right now, the sun hits the whole shelter. So you cannot, and the, and the seniors uh, are, are complaining a lot, and they, they talk to each other. And they, that's one of the more concerns of, of Villa, uh, and many more. Uh, how and the bus stops, they're in the middle of the block, like in Fredericksburg. That's why you have so many in the past that have been killed in, in wheelchairs or crossing the middle of Fredericksburg. You can look at the bus stops. You know, or even here from the Samoa the military, there's some bus stops in the middle of the block. And you have to walk back. Barely they can walk, they can get to the bus stop and barely they can get up on to the foot of on, in, into the step of the bus. You know, that's what many, one of the many problems uh, that we as seniors have with the, the VIA bus. Okay, well, we're documenting that. That does definitely sound like a transportation issue. Yes. If you can't wait, we all know you've got to wait for the bus, right? Yeah. It doesn't get there as soon as you arrive at the bus stop, but that is a, that is a total uh, It's an issue for us, for the seniors. Absolutely. We'll go about that now. Thank you for that answer. Okay. Anyone else? Or we can get started with the closing of our... Okay. So I maybe already did it, but I handed out this card, and at the top it says, how would you make San Antonio an even better place to live for people of all ages? When you write down your suggestion, we really want you to look at the eight domains that we mentioned, housing, transportation, and really write down one or two of your priorities for your communities, where you live, whether it's here, whether it's you know, another part of town, 
write down what you would consider to be an issue. And if it's housing and you want to go into a little bit more detail, rehab homes, more you know, ramps, whatever it would be, parks, maybe it's a grandparents' park in my side of town. And if you want to put, I live in the south, I live in the north, I live here in the west. Please do that. We're going to collect these. What we're doing with these is we're going to get with Council Councilman Diego Bernal, Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez. I know her reference here earlier. And it'll be a wrap up into the information that we use to formulate our plan. Again, this is not the only opportunity for, in, for your input. There will actually be a survey that will be conducted by a professional group and we'll be going out to several of our members and non members. So if you do that, I hope you did enjoy your lunch. I really do thank you for your time. I know we took some time here, and especially to get set up and get served, but again, I thank you for your patience. And I wish you all the best of luck, and congratulations on all the work you have been doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, can you just turn these? We're going to pick those up, yes. Yeah. <laughs>